My grandmothers were some of the first women to be able to benefit from it. So here's the story of two grandmothers. I have my grandmother Belle and my, my grandmother Robinson. My grandmother Robinson went to college. She didn't complete college because for various reasons she came home. But the story was is that my grandfather missed her so much and worried so much that he offered to buy her her own piano if she would leave college, <laughs> and she did. That's what the story is. But she did go to college, and she came back. My other grandmother, of course, did not. Um, my grandmother Robinson married my, very, my grandfather Robinson, and they owned the country store in Deer Range, Alabama. Have y'all seen Range as y'all are driving south? Uh, on the interstate, that's the community that my family's from. And my grandfather was the postmaster and was the, um, the, of the general store there. And my other grandmother, my grandmother, Belle, my grandfather, Belle, worked for the railroad, so he would run off and uh, he was superintendent for, and built bridges. And so he would leave on Monday, uh, catch, the, catch the train in Lenox and then he would uh, come back on Friday. So my grandmother Belle was doing everything she knew to do to keep the farm going and keep four children fed until my, bro my grandfather would get back. So when, when election times would come, I had gr one grandmother who voted and one grandmother who did not. My grandmother Robinson voted. She was actually a poll watcher. She was an election official because you know, the, the, the poll was in her in, her, in their store. Right. Okay. So she voted every election. My grandmother Belle did not vote, even though they were not the poorest folks in the community, and actually, because of my grandfather's job, probably had about, you know, was very comfortable. Um, she did not vote until the poll tax, the poll tax was uh, abolished. So when the, the framers of the Constitution put the poll tax, when the poll tax was passed, they were trying to disenfranchise our black voters, weren't they? But they were also trying to disenfranchise poor voters. Now my grandmother wasn't poor, but a dollar fifty or a dollar seventy five or whatever it was, that paid for a lot of stuff, you know, back in those days until it was abolished. I have my mother's poll receipts where she paid her poll tax when she would go vote. So my, I had my grandmother when asked the question, why did you, um, you know, did you not vote? She said I started voting. I said when did you start voting? I started voting when they when they did away with poll tax, because you know, um, with the cost of it, it was enough for le less my grandfather to represent the family. But once the poll tax was abolished, then I began to vote. They benefited. They benefited, and we have benefited, from the courage of so many people that Dr. Claybo has been discussing. And I, so many of the, the things that the, 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 the women that went before us, that paved the way so that we could participate in our government in a meaningful way. So what state Y'all remember what state became the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment? Tennessee. Anybody? Tennessee. Tennessee. So fortunately, the representative in Tennessee, he did not, uh, let's just say, he might have been a little bit persuaded by, by oratory <coughs> like this. God the senator from the U.S. Senator from Georgia said, had intended the sexes to be different. Their duties and obligations were of equal value, but they could never be the same. Man was created to be the head of the family and deal with the sterner realities and difficulties. It was up to men to take responsibility for the state in military and political matters. Politics was in its nature laborious. And for its practice, the male sex is infinitely better suited. The female, the woman, was formed for other things. She's the queen of the family. She's fitted for the discharge of sacred trust of wife and the endearing relation of mother. While the man is contending with the sterner realities of life and duties of life, the whole time, 
of the noble, affectionate, and true woman is required in the discharge of the delicate and difficult duties assigned her in the family circle, in church relations, and in society where her lot is cast. He went on to say, if suffrage were passed, the baser class of women should go to the polls. Refined ladies would stay at home. Fortunately for us, Representative Harry Byrne didn't listen to the folks in Tennessee that sounded just like the folks, those senators in Georgia. He listened to who? Do y'all remember? His mother. his mother. He listened to his mother, a letter from his mother beseeching him to do the right thing. He did the right thing and women achieved the right to vote. And since then, it's hard to believe. It's just been 100 years. But since then, the Danville Reporter in 1922, and that is Danville, Kentucky. The Danville Reporter in 1922 said, it is striking to note how quickly the women of the southern and southwestern states are growing active and even influential. If they will but exert a good and beneficent influence in the politics and public affairs, feminism in politics may prove a great blessing to the country. So we are, all of us, the beneficiaries, as you know, of those who have gone before us. The job that we do now is to make sure that our students and those that we come in contact with understand what a great blessing it is to be able to vote. You know, I gave a speech in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, it was on the importance, and I thought it was not a very sexy topic. It was called Binding Precedent. Do y'all ever want to give a speech on Binding Precedent? <laughs> well, somebody needs to uh, explain it uh, to certain people. It's called the rule of law. No one is above the law. Amen. No one. Amen. No man. No woman. No matter what position they hold. And um, the people in Brazil are mandated to vote. Let me say that one more time. It is the law that they vote, and they have 97% turnout, 97% turnout. They are mandated to vote. If they don't vote, they can't get a marriage license. They don't go to jail if they can't, because I mean, you could, you know. They, 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 get, they can't get a car tag. They can't get a marriage license. They can't get, you know, file deeds. They get basically penalized you know, in a civil way if they don't vote. We don't, no one's going to have mandatory voting in the United States of America. We, we wouldn't want that, right? Mm -hmm. But we do want our policymakers to make it easier to vote, to take away and, and the, the lack of access, to do something about the lack of access to our polls. And we basically have policymakers in Alabama that want to make it less um, convenient to vote rather than more, more so. So I want to say again, those are the issues that y'all, please be preaching it. Please be preaching it. And give your students the opportunity. Give them bonus points if they will come back to you with their emails and um, showing that they've emailed their legislator. Give them bonus points if they go to the county commission or to city hall. Give them bonus points when you see and that they are engaged, that they've gone and worked for a campaign. Do everything you can to help because that is going to be our uh, salvation, our absolute salvation. So, in closing, I, you know, you've heard me tell stories about my daddy. I just got to close with the story about my daddy. <laughs> just got to. So, when, I, as I told you, running around all over uh, as he helped me campaign, uh, it was, it was in when I was running for chief justice that um, my, got that terrible phone call that my father had had a very serious stroke. So I race back, uh, get to Evergreen, and um, then we get into Montgomery, and then we have to go through rehab, and, and he, he, he improves, he improves. But he had, it was aphasia, it caused aphasia, and made it very difficult for him to communicate. And my daddy loved to tell a story. I bet y'all find that hard to believe, right? <laughs> and he loved to tell a story. A lot of them turkey hunting stories, deer hunting stories, um, probably some stories about his little girl. So 
he did and was able to see me elected Chief Justice, although he was not able to be there. Um, and so now I'm going to be sworn in, and it's just a couple of weeks before that. And I'm, I'm went and stayed with him New Year's Eve so that my brother, you know, would not be around, even though we had care for him, but we just wanted someone there. And so I go and check on him as about to hit the new year uh, for 2007, and I see that he was awake. And I go and lay down beside him, and I said, Daddy, it's, it's, it's the new year. It's 2007. And he looks over at me, and he says, Hon, you made it to the big time, didn't you? And I said, well, if I did, it's because of you and Mama. So then I'm sworn in, and unfortunately his health prevented him from able to be at the swearing-in. Um, but he got to see the video, and then four months later, I got that terrible phone call that he had had that last final stroke where his brain stem, uh, in his brain stem, and the time was short. So I raced back to Evergreen, and I'm there, and for two days with him. And we lost him, but we know where he is. So as we're at my parents' home getting ready, uh, to go, all of us to go to the funeral home to do things that y'all have all done, mm -hmm. make those arrangements. There's a knock at the door, and the knock is our postman, a 35-year-old Gilbert Harden that later, later became postman. Um, and he came in, he said, I couldn't just drop off the mail. He said, I just had to come in. I had to tell y'all how much I'm going to miss Big O. He said, Big O, if it hadn't been for Big O, he said, me and my little brother, my daddy had to work every Saturday. If it hadn't been for Big O, me and my little brother never made it in the woods. We'd never learn to hunt if it hadn't been for your daddy. And we thanked him. I said, Gilbert, thank you so much. He said, it's a shared loss. I said, thank you, Gilbert. Let me do something, he said. Let me do something. And I said, well, I don't know what that would be, Gilbert. And he said, as I was walking up to your dad's door, I saw sticks in the yard. Would it be all right with you at the end of my shift if I come back and pick up the sticks? So I share that for two reasons. One, for, to remind ourselves that unexpressed gratitude is no gratitude at all. It's like a, it's not said, it's like a gift not given, mm -hmm. and that it's not just saying the words, it's showing your gratitude. And then I say it always as a challenge to myself, and I hope a challenge to each of us, that we live our lives so that when our end comes, somebody is going to want to come to our house and pick up the sticks. Thank y'all so much.